Sequel or no sequel? The war is finally over. Datadog just analyzed 2.5 million services and now we know what the result of the sequel versus no sequel war is. And it might be the worst outcome possible. Because for a decade now, the Databus world was this fight between SQL versus NoSQL, right? You had to pick a side. You had relational databases which were considered dinosaurs and NoSQL being this new kid on the block, but they couldn't do real transactions. And you have all these architecture meetings and bunch of tech blogs and conference talks. Everyone was convinced that their side would eventually win. Well, the war is now over, okay? Datadog published research from 2.5 million production services. Yes, you heard that right, 2.5 million services. And we finally know what is winning this war. But here's the thing, Datadog's data tells a very different story than what you would expect from a war that has been won. Because if SQL had won, we would all be on something like Postgres, problem solved. If no SQL had won, we would all be on maybe MongoDB and problem solved. Either way, one database, one approach, move on with your life, but that's not what happened. And what did happen is worse than the war itself. Let's take a look. Now, first thing I wanna clarify, this isn't some random survey, okay? So this is the best data that we can possibly hope to have about something like this. What kind of databases are companies using today actually in services? Are they using more relational? than NoSQL? It's a simple question, but how do we get real data from this? Well, now we have the data from a company called Datadog. They are a monitoring company that sees inside tens of thousands of production systems, right? Thousands of companies have used Datadog to monitor their systems. So they are getting actual data from, as I said before, 2.5 million services over the past year, right? So this is real production data from real companies that are using databases today. And here's what they found. More than half of all organizations now use three or more database technologies, not three databases, okay? Three different types of databases. So think of it as Postgres and MongoDB and Redis and Elasticsearch, three types of technologies and a quarter of organizations, about 25%, use five or more database technologies. That's nearly the same percent as the number of companies that use one. So 25% use just one technology, and 25% use five or more database technologies. And nearly half of all organizations use both SQL and NoSQL together at the same time. So the answer to SQL or NoSQL turned out to be Yes, but wait, there's one more stat which is really scary, and this is kind of buried in the middle of the article. Nearly 70% of organizations have adopted message queues, right? Things like RabbitMQ, Kafka, SQS. Seven out of every 10 companies needed to add an entirely new category of infrastructure just to make all these databases talk to each other. Now, if you look at the article, I'm gonna post the article in the description. Datadog frames this all as a victory, right? They call it, polyglot persistence. Well, you are a big enterprise, you gotta use the right tool for the job. So you use SQL for transactions, right tool for the job, NoSQL for scaling, again, right tool for the job, Redis for caching, Elasticsearch for search. It's unsensible, right? But here's where my alarm starts to go off when I read that. Let me ask you something about this data, specifically the 70% message queue stat, right? 70% of all organizations have adopted message queues. Now, there are, of course, many reasons why companies would use something like message queues, but here is one reason which actually ties with the other data. When you have one database, coordination is pretty simple, right? You want to have a transaction, you wrap all your changes in the transaction. So either everything commits or everything rolls back, the database handles it. Now, if you have SQL, NoSQL, some kind of a caching system like Redis, you have Elasticsearch for search, and we have four databases, four different systems, and none of them can talk to each other. None of them can share transactions. So when you have service A that needs to write to Postgres and needs service B to update MongoDB, how do they coordinate? You can't do a transaction across them. So what happens is service A calls service B synchronously, and service B calls service C. Now you've created 
like a chain, right? If any of that link in the chain breaks or slows or goes down, the whole request fails. So the solution is message queues, right? Instead of waiting for a response, service A just drops a message into a message queue and then moves on. And service B picks up that message whenever it's ready. So no more cascading failures, right? So you have service A updating one type of database and then sending a message to service B, go update this other database. And that sends a message to service C saying, go update this other database. So now you have no more cascading failures and no more timeouts. And that's one benefit of the message queue. And here's what that 70% stat is telling us. So seven out of 10 organizations had to bolt on Kafka or RabbitMQ because their synchronous calls across all these databases are failing. And if you think about it, the more databases they add, the more fragile the system becomes. And the message queues probably weren't a part of their original architecture, but they had to add that as a fix when you couldn't have everything depending on everything else because things will start breaking, right? So there's not a feature as an architectural choice. It's more of a band-aid for possibly a self-inflicted wound of creating too many databases in your architecture diagram. Setting all this aside, there is also now a GraphQL problem because here's another thing you lose when you fragment your data across multiple databases. You lose joins. Think about it, with one database, you could write a query that says, give me users with their orders and product information for their orders is one query. The database kind of figures out how to stitch the data together, right? But when your users are in Postgres and your orders are in MongoDB and products are in some other instance, now you can't join across these databases. So you need something to kind of stitch the data together at the application layer. And that's where enter GraphQL. GraphQL lets you define like a schema that spans across all your data sources, right? So when a client asks for users with their orders and products, GraphQL breaks it down into pieces. They call it a resolver function, right? So it creates a resolver function for users, another resolver for orders, another resolver for products. Each resolver then goes and fetches the piece of data from wherever the data lives. Sounds elegant, right? But here's the problem. The Datadog's data shows that 55% of GraphQL services have more than 10 child resolver operations per query. And some services, this is quoting directly, handle over 100 resolvers per execution. Can you believe that? One call to GraphQL triggers 100 resolvers. So what used to be a single database query with a join is now 100 network requests bouncing between all these different services and databases. You know what we used to call when one operation triggers 100 database queries, it was classically called the n plus one problem. We spend years teaching developers to avoid this pattern, right? Entire ORM frameworks were built to specifically prevent this n plus one problem. And now this is architecturally mandated. We just moved it from the ORM layer to the API layer and now we call it a feature. We call it resolvers in GraphQL. But wait, there's actually more. Datadog also shows that 44% of organizations have adopted cloud data platforms like Snowflake or Redshift or BigQuery. They frame this as modern analytics. But let me translate that for you. 44% of organizations have kind of accepted that they can no longer query their own production data. It's spread across so many databases. So the only way to answer basic business questions is to copy over everything into a completely separate system. Basically, they've admitted defeat at this point. So this is, I don't know, man, it's really crazy. You know, you folks know Martin Fowler, right? He's the guy who had all these design patterns, brilliant thinker. He is the guy who literally coined the term polyglot persistence. And when he coined the term, he said it as a warning. In his original article, he says, this will come as a cost. He warned people to limit it to strategic projects. And how many of our projects are strategic? I bet a lot of these are simple crud apps. And I don't know, before you think I'm being too grumpy, like I'm a grumpy old developer, let me clarify. When it is justified, polyglot persistence actually works really well, 
okay? So some companies are making it work. So for example, Netflix, right? Netflix uses Cassandra for global replication. It uses Redis for caching, and it uses MySQL for all its user transactions and all that stuff. And of course, for search, it uses Elasticsearch. Similarly, Uber, it handles 40 million reads per second across a huge polyglot stack, right? These companies genuinely need multiple databases because they have genuinely different problems at genuinely different scale. But here's the thing that we have to acknowledge. Most teams are not Netflix. There is this growing body of evidence about something called the distributed monolith problem. And the examples are kind of painful. Amazon Prime Video published a case study about moving away from microservices back to monolith. It became a little controversial. But basically what they claimed was they saved 90% on infrastructure costs and all they had to do was move back to a monolith. And Amazon Prime is a part of AWS who is pushing people to adopt microservices because that's what gets them revenue on AWS services. I mean, that's odd. There is this thing called Segment, which is a customer data platform that Twilio acquired. It went from like 150 microservices back to a single monolith application, right? 150 services, they just consolidated into one application because the maintenance overhead was actually crippling developer productivity. This is what they say. And there is a clear performance impact, right? Operations that took, for example, 50 milliseconds in a monolith take 2,000 milliseconds across 12 network calls in microservices, right? That's 40x lower, right? Something around that. So uh, there was this post, which I'm also gonna post in the link link in the description. So there was this guy called Christian Posta. I'm gonna post the link in the description, who literally wrote books about microservices. He puts it this way. Data, data integration, data boundaries are all the hard parts of microservices. Not Spring Boot, not Kubernetes, not Docker. The data is the hardest part of the microservices. And the problem is when we started this out, the journey in 2000s, right? We had this very popular pattern said, okay, you should not have shared databases and microservices, right? Shared databases create coupling. Every schema change requires cross team collaboration. So we should have individual services, individual databases. But now in 2024, we have taken it to the other extreme. We have five different databases, each with their own schema, connected by message queues and queried through GraphQL resolvers and all analyzed in a separate data warehouse coordinated by Saga pattern or whatever crazy pattern we come up with and all monitored by Datadog, right? We didn't remove the coordination problem. We just spread it around, we distributed it. So basically here's my verdict on Datadog's research, right? They frame it as a very positive thing. And the data is absolutely valid, right? They have access to all these services, which not many people have. 2.5 million services is a massive sample size. So these numbers are real, okay? I trust the numbers. But what I don't trust is their framing. Think about what Datadog does. Datadog is an observability company. They make money when you have more things to monitor. They're not gonna make money if you have a monolith and one MySQL database, right? Every additional database, every message queue, every microservice, that's one more metric to track another log to aggregate or some trace that you gotta visualize. So more complexity isn't a problem for Datadog. That's their business model. So they thrive when this gets complex. You wanna know how much lucrative this complexity is? You folks know about Coinbase, right? It's a crypto exchange company. They had a $65 million Datadog bill in a single year. $65 million that one company spent just for monitoring, okay? So basically what they did was they built an internal team to migrate off of Datadog and onto open source tools, right? Datadog had to give them a special deal just to keep them as a customer. So when Datadog publishes research which says more databases are great, polyglot persistence is great, maybe consider the source. My take is, well, the SQL versus NoSQL debate has died, right? Nobody has won, or perhaps everybody has won. So what we've got instead is we've got more complexity. We have eventual consistency everywhere because we really cannot afford strong consistency with all these different databases. And we've got new categories of problems. We've got Saga failures, we've got GraphQL N plus one performance issues, we have distributed transaction issues, and we have entire platform teams just for managing the platform that manages your databases. But 
Here is a stat from the same article that I keep coming back to. 25% of organizations still use one database. That is reassuring to me. I bet they're sleeping better than teams that are managing five. So what do we do with this information? Here's my framework. If you have a genuinely different data access pattern, right? Genuinely different data access patterns that you cannot optimize with a single database, then you should consider polyglot persistence. There is a reason for it, right? Actually different patterns that you can identify and measure in production. If you have strong platform engineering teams who can manage the complexity, again, sure you can do it if you're part of a large company like Netflix. Netflix have entire teams just for the data infrastructure. And finally, if you have hit some kind of a limit with your current database, perhaps polyglot persistence is fine. But if you are like a startup or if your engineering team is under 20 people, you don't have the headcount to manage distributed databases and the complexity involved. It blows my mind that so many companies have so many databases. Do they have the resources to handle it? Have they measured that the current database is a bottleneck and that's the reason why they're doing it? Or they're just doing it because they see other people doing it? Is there, you know, they say resume-driven development. Is this resume-driven development? It's, uh, it's funny because modern Postgres can do a lot. It's very capable. It has a bunch of stuff that NoSQL databases can do, and it has full text search. It has proper indexing. It can hold JSON data. Done the right way, it's actually a very capable database. And as for the SQL versus NoSQL war, I say we declare a ceasefire. The battle has moved from which database should we use, and now it's like, how do we coordinate all these different databases that we are already using? I don't know, it feels like it's a larger pattern in the industry. We keep trying to solve problems by just adding more layers. So at some point, we have to ask, was the original problem actually that hard? Was this all necessary? I don't know, let me know what you folks think. Like, how many databases does your organization have? And more importantly, do you see that as being an excess? Do you think you could get away with fewer? My hypothesis is yes, but uh, I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments what you think.